let's face it, whether you're hiring or trying to find work today, the process has become tougher than ever. Between ghost listings, AI-powered applicant tracking systems, and job scams, how do you know if your resume or your job posting is even being seen by an actual human? That's why we've relaunched our job board to help you find your next opportunity. And if you're a company that's hiring right now, take advantage of the September surge. We'll feature your listing on our job board for 30 days and help spread the word about it to our audience of podcast listeners for just $99. Get started with us and expand your job search or recruiting efforts today. Revisionpath.com forward slash jobs. You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast. A weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Revision Path. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Maurice Cherry. Revision Path is supported by Brevity and Wit. Brevity & Wit is a strategy and design firm committed to designing a more inclusive and equitable world. They are always looking to expand their roster of freelance design consultants in the U.S., particularly brand strategists, copywriters, graphic designers, and web developers. If you know how to deliver excellent creative work reliably and enjoy the autonomy of a virtual-based freelance life with no non-competes, check them out at brevityandwit.com. Brevity & Wit. Creative excellence without the grind. For 10 years, Revision Path has been dedicated to showcasing black designers and creatives from all over the world. In order to keep bringing you the content that you love, we need your support now more than ever. If you're in a position to help us grow, here's how you can contribute. Visit revisionpath.com forward slash donate and click the donate button there to make a one-time, monthly, or annual donation to help keep Revision Path running strong. Thanks for your support. We also got a new review on Apple Podcasts. This is from Art Girl One, and it's titled Excellent Design Podcast. Here it is. Revision Path is an amazing resource for graphic designers throughout every step of their journey. I take something inspiring away after every episode. Thank you, Maurice, for your amazing interviews. Art Girl One, thank you so much for not only being a listener, but for leaving us a review and a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. Speaking of which, listener, have you left us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts? If not, don't worry. Go ahead and pause this episode. I'll wait. And you can go do that. Every single review that we get helps bump us up in the algorithm for discoverability which everything's run by algorithms now unfortunately that's a whole other story but every review helps us in the algorithm for discoverability it's a really great way to let us know how you're enjoying the show and just like art girl one's review i'll even read it right here so you know it's a triple win or double win or something like that but anyway if you haven't left us a review please go and do so again art girl one thank you so so much for that great review and for the five star rating super duper appreciate that now for this week's interview i'm talking with carmel kendall carmel is an art director designer and illustrator born and raised in atlanta georgia She's the co-founder of Neighborly, a paper goods company, and her book, Your Freedom, Your Power, A Kid's Guide to the First Amendment, just came out a few weeks ago, so we'll put a link to that in the show notes. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. So I'm Carmel Kendall. I am a creative director, designer, founder of Neighborly Paper an illustrator for a children's book called Your Freedom, Your Power. Yeah, I saw the book as I was doing uh, my research. Uh, came out with Penguin Random House on July 25th, and I'll make sure that we put a link to that in the show notes. I'm curious, like, are you spending the summer, like, doing a book tour or doing anything with publicizing the book? I'm not doing a book tour, but I have spoken with the authors and We kind of have our rollout plans on how we plan on getting the word out there. I'm super, super excited about it. This is my first children's book ever. So this was a goal of mine for like a long-term goal. So 
I was very surprised when they hit me up to do this project, but I'm super excited about it and just trying to get the word out there any way that I can, because this is a book that is very much needed right now with the current climate in the United States. Yeah. How did you get involved with it? Did the author reach out to you directly? Actually, the art director at Random House hit me up, saw my work just on the internet and on Instagram and kind of traced it back to me, hit me up and just said, you know, there's a new book coming out called Your Freedom, Your Power, and wanted to know if I was interested in learning more about the project. And of course, you know, I said, yes, I was over the moon, elated about it. And then she, you know, just went into detail about what the book was going to be about. She showed me who the authors were. Allison Matuli is a lawyer. And then Clelia Castro Malaspina, I believe is how you say her last name, is a writer. And they kind of paired up to write this book. And it's really about, it's a middle school level book. And it's about how to protest, how to write a letter to your representative, how to write a petition, just everything on, you know, how to get your voice out there. I think it's super important book that middle schoolers need. Honestly, you know, adults need, (laughs) like everybody Mm -hmm. needs. But it's super fun. It's in a way that's just, you know, really straightforward and plain for the younger audience. It also talks about previous historic cases throughout the United States history that kind of changed the course of America and learning from those cases and and how to implement all of that into today's society. So it's really important. Yeah, I love the idea of a sort of kid slash, like, I guess, teenager focused book about civics Mm because I mean I don't I don't have children but like I don't know if they teach civics (laughs) in school anymore I mean that sort of stuff you mentioned with the book like we learned it in I learned it in civics in seventh grade but like Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's such the case now especially over the past I would say maybe 10 to 15 years and we definitely have seen in the news you know protests and things where people are really exercising their civic rights it's not really taught as to how you go about doing it. Because I think it really crops up around elections. Because mm-hmm. we're like, oh, write your congressperson, this, that, or the other. Right. But how do you start that? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. How do you even make that happen, you know? Yeah. And you can do it on like such a small level. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't even have to be like around presidential elections, but it's it's literally just about anything that you want to change. Like you have the power to do it. You have the voice to do it and like here are the tools to help you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, even I learned a lot from reading the book and illustrating the images. I was just like, wow, this is such a needed book right now. Very cool. We've actually had, man, I think we've had a few children's illustrators on the show fairly recently. I know we had Aliana Harris. We had Akeem Roberts. You had a couple of folks on the show recently that have, have done like children's books, illustrations, kid lit, as they called it. Mm-hmm. Uh, is that sort of a, a dream of yours to do more books like that? It is. I have so many ideas. I have so many ideas for children's books that I want to do. So I'm hoping that this kickstarts just a new a line of employment for me because <laughs> I had a lot of fun doing it. It was a lot of work. I will say this book, it took over a year and a half. I believe, total to do it. The deadline got pushed back a few times. The manuscript changed a few times. So very much a labor of love for sure. But, you know, I love doing it and I have so many ideas for other children's books. So I'm hoping to get started on those like now (laughs) so that I Mm -hmm. can keep the momentum going and, you know, keep this ball rolling. But yeah, I loved it. I definitely want to continue for sure. Nice. Do you have like representation yet? I don't. So I am debating on, I've had people reach out to me for representation, but I also, I have another illustrator friend and she was like, don't do it. (laughs) Oh, why is that? She said, so from her experience, she said that she had a representator or representative (laughs) for her illustrations. And that it didn't work out because she felt like they weren't really like pushing her work out there and that they were pretty much just tagging on their percentage for a lot of the work that was coming in, not from them, like just people coming in organically to her and then having her representative take a percentage off 
without really finding the work for her. And so she got into some royalties, like children's books that have royalties. And now her representative gets a percentage for life. Like Oh, forever. wow. <laughs> and they didn't come to her through the representative. And so she was just telling me, you know, it's not worth it. And, you know, just kind of do it on your own. So I don't know. I'm a little on the fence about that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> I, I could I could understand then why you'd want to kind of give that some more some more thought. I know some of the yeah. folks that I mentioned that we've had on the show, they are represented. I think one of them in particular is represented by like I think it's a it's either a black agency or it's one that is is geared towards like black work or black or BIPOC work. I oh, could interesting. Say. But I don't know. I feel kind of like for illustrators, maybe it just makes sense because like you don't have to do that legwork to yeah. find work. Like it, they kind of just come to you. But then mm-hmm. if it's a situation like you mentioned with your friend, that's that sucks because like they're getting a cut of money for yeah. not even really doing the work, you know? Mm-hmm. So the one that I, I talked to, I asked that question. I was kind of like, okay, so if somebody comes to me without you, like if they see me on Instagram or whatever and hits me up, then do you get that percentage? And she said, yes. Like mm. that's the way her contracts work. And so I, it made me hesitant. So I said no at that time because I was like, well, let me do some more research because I don't know <laughs> about this. Yeah. No, that's fair. That makes that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so aside from the book, like what else do you have planned for the summer? So aside from the book, I'm working a lot on Neighborly Paper, which is my paper company rolling out new products all through the summer and hoping to get into some more stores come fall um, so that everybody will be able to purchase Neighborly from a store near them. (laughs) I will make sure to link to the segment that I saw you on where you were featured on the Today Show. Yeah, that's big. Talking about Neighborly, I think at the time in the it was like in 2020. Is that right? Yes. February 2020. Oh, during Black History Month. I know, I think it, it mentioned you were in, I think, 20 stores at the time. Was it only 20? Oh, my gosh. We've Look at you, only so 20. Was it only 20? <laughs> <laughs> wow. I don't even remember the number at that point. But wow, yeah. It might have been 20 at that point. <laughs> but we've definitely grown a lot since being on the Today Show, for sure. Well, let's talk about Neighborly. Let's get into that. How did you sort of come up with the idea to start that? So it was actually my business partner's idea. So at that point, okay. where we started it in 2016 in New York City. We were both living there in Harlem. And my business partner is actually a childhood friend of mine. We grew up as neighbors in Fayetteville, Georgia. We grew up as neighbors. We ended up living in Harlem together as neighbors again. And so she's a writer. And she had the idea of coming up with a greeting card line at that time. And asked me, was I interested in doing some illustrations for the line? And so I said, well, let me see first what the lines are and, you know, what I can bring with the illustrations. You know, I didn't I didn't say yes immediately because I wanted to just make sure I could actually do this. And she sent me the lines. They were hilarious. I thought it was great. Super cute. I spent the weekend just kind of drawing some images to the design. I mean, to the lines. She ended up loving it. And then she said, well, I think we should call it Neighborly since we grew up as neighbors and we're neighbors again. And I loved that idea, designed the logo and everything. Initially, we started out our line with holiday starting Mm -hmm. in 2016. So we had Christmas. We ended up doing some little, at this point, it it was like October. So we did little Halloween postcards that we gave out as freebies so that people could just get our website out there. But yeah, we started out with eight cards for holiday. We completely sold out of those cards. We had a total of 800. We did like 100 each. Completely sold out of those cards. Unexpectedly, we were like, wow, people really love this. And then, you know, people were like, when are, when are the Valentine's cards coming out? When are the, when are you going to have birthday <laughs> cards? When are you? And, you know, initially I was like, wow, this, I thought it would just be like a little hobby, like, I would draw a new card every few months, but now people are like, when are the next cards coming out? You know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. It, but then we were like, okay, this is a viable like business right now. Like we actually need to, you know, come out with more inventory. So that's how it started. I love the name neighborly. I love that whole sort of concept of it coming from the fact that you and your business partner 
we're neighbors. That's really cute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so and now we're actually both back in Atlanta. Neighbors again. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. Neighbors and business partners. That's dope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So right now you're working at an agency now. But before that work, you were at Dagger as mm -hmm. an associate creative director and a senior art director. Tell me about that. Yeah. So started at Dagger in 2020 as a senior art director, worked on Crystal, which is a fast food restaurant in the Southeast, worked on Buffalo Wild Wings, and then got promoted to ACD, which is Associate Creative Director, where I worked on Aflac and a brand called Rent. But yeah, it was, it was fun. Like Dagger was great. I learned so much. We did a huge rebranding for Crystal at that time, which was amazing. I got to lead that which leading a rebrand of that size was just amazing. I loved it. That's one of my favorite projects today, just because the client gave us so much freedom. We pretty much changed everything except for the logo, which is like a dream. <laughs> like not mm. a lot of brands let you do that, let you change the colors and let you explore typography and things like that. So, so much fun. I loved it. There's a couple of things I, I sort of know about Dagger. Like I've, I've heard of it here as a, as a local agency, one of the projects, I think it's either from Dagger or maybe Dagger acquired it. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but butter.atl mm -hmm. is like part of, is it part of Dagger? Is it like just a, a project that they do? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It started out as a part of Dagger and then now they've kind of branched out and Dagger, I think is just known as like an investor at this point, but now it's its own entity. Okay. Yeah. I've, uh, I know about Brandon Butler. Brandon's been on the show before. Uh, mm -hmm. he was actually one of the very first people I had on the show way oh, awesome. back yeah. in 2013. He was working at Edelman at the time, but I had heard of him because he, I don't know if people know that Brandon Butler is kind of something of like an Atlanta, like Wonderkind. Like he had a website store in North DeKalb Mall. I want to say it was North oh, DeKalb cool. Mall where like you could literally go into a store in the mall and buy a website this was well what? before i think he did he did butter but um, really? I, wow. I remember hearing about butter and i know that brandon was at at dagger so i wasn't mm -hmm. sure sort of what that relationship was yeah mm -hmm. yeah dagger i guess helped start it it started at dagger but now it's it's definitely its own business but yeah nice I'm wondering, like, it probably was really cool to work on with Crystal kind of being such a, it's not an Atlanta, I mean, it's, I guess you could say it's a known Atlanta brand. It's I think, mm -hmm. founded in Tennessee, but it's headquartered now here in Atlanta. I bet that was something kind of working on such a, a well-known Atlanta slash Southern brand like that. Yeah. When they, when I was interviewing and they said that Crystal wanted to do a rebrand and they never really done a rebrand like ever in history, that is what made me want to take the job because what brands have been around that have just never done a rebrand and are just kind of like, we want you to lead this project. It's like, wow, you know, that was a dream come true and something that doesn't happen very often. And so I definitely took the job for, for that project because I, I just was really excited to do a rebrand of that scale. Let's dive a little bit into that project because you said it was, you know, such a, a grand redesign like that. Mm -hmm. What did that entail? Like, what did the team look like? How did that process even go? The team was so small. <laughs> um, <laughs> it literally was me and another designer. We ended up getting some freelance help because it just was massive. But it didn't happen all at once. It happened over the course of like a year, I would say. So yeah, it wasn't crazy where we did it in like a month or so. like it. We really did take our time with it. But yeah, like I said, the only rule was don't change the logo. So everything else was pretty much sky's the limit. So they knew they wanted something more modern, more fresh, just more current. I just feel like, you know, everything was kind of looking a little outdated just because they hadn't had a rebrand in forever. So, you know, we updated the colors, we made it more just popping. Like we wanted everything to pop. We, we did product photography for all of the menu items, which was one of my favorite parts. We wanted the food to look more realistic. You know, we wanted if sauce dripping down, some of the ingredients might have fallen onto the plate, you know, things like that. 
we thought of every little detail that you could think of, typography, colors, design elements. We did some illustrations for it. We had all new photography, all new models, just everything from start to finish. We did everything. Wow. And then, like you said, it took like over like a year to sort mm-hmm. of pull it all together. Yeah. Now, when you started out at Dagger, you were an art director, right? And when you yes. left, you were an associate creative director. Tell me mm-hmm. kind of, I guess, one, because, and I, I know this because I hear this either from a lot of freelancers or just from a lot of people. They kind of use art director and creative director rather interchangeably. Like to you, what is the the difference between the two? And how did you shift from becoming an art director to a creative director? Yeah, I, I see people using them interchangeably as well. And I definitely don't think they should be using them interchangeably. For me, our director, you're way more in the weeds of the work. You're working under the creative director. So for me, the creative director is more so leading the charge, but the art director is kind of implementing what the creative director sets in motion is kind of how I see it. So when I first started at Dagger as a senior art director, I definitely was more in the weeds. And then when I left as associate creative director, I was more so overseeing, like you're managing the teams, you're managing the day-to-day of the teams, you're more so delegating the work, you're making sure everything is cohesive, of course, and everything kind of fits together. Um, Mm -hmm. But as art director, you're definitely doing the day-to-day, whereas creative director, you're leading the way. I got you. That makes sense now that you kind of put it that way. It it does seem like something you would sort of organically level up to, because if Mm -hmm. you're in the weeds, then of course you're able to be an effective creative director because you know what it's like to be at that level where you're kind of hands-on with the work in that way. Mm -hmm. And you definitely, as a creative director, need to understand what it takes to make the vision come alive. And I feel like understanding what it takes, you have to be in as the art director, you have to be as the designer so you can understand, okay, this is going to take this amount of time. This may not be possible, but this is, you know, like you kind of need to know those things. And the only way to know those things is to be in the weeds of the work. Mm, That makes sense. I got you. Yeah. Now I kind of want to, you know, shift gears here a little bit. Of course, we've talked a, a good bit about your work, but I'm curious to kind of know more about your journey leading up to all of this. Now, you are one of the rare Atlanta natives I think I've had on this show, which is <laughs> <laughs> which is great over over 10 years. Tell me about growing up here. Yeah, so initially my family is from the southwest Atlanta, like our first house was on Cascade <laughs> Road. Okay. And then ended up moving to Fayetteville when I was little, um and that's mainly where I grew up. I went to private school. I went to Woodward Academy for a long time before transferring, right. going to public school and high school where I transferred to Sandy Creek. So that's where I graduated from, which is Fayette County School, and then moved away where I went to Howard for undergrad. How was Howard? Howard was amazing. I mean, best four years of my life. I'm pretty sure that's what all the Howard grads say. <laughs> from at least the ones I know. (laughs) But yeah, Howard was amazing. I mean, I highly suggest everybody go there. (laughs) Now, when you went there, you were studying marketing. Did you kind of already have that in mind when you went, like when you graduated high school, you knew you wanted to get into marketing? No, absolutely not. I didn't know what I wanted. I honestly didn't think about it. (laughs) I wasn't the type of person to like, I don't know. I, when I was in growing up, my goal in life, I wanted to be a background dancer. <laughs> like, okay. I didn't take school and stuff that seriously. <laughs> and so, you know, when I graduated from high school, I didn't know what I wanted to be at all. I just wanted to go out and party and have a good time. <laughs> so I just picked it randomly because I just was like, oh, business, that sounds cool. Like, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing not at the at the choice, but I'm laughing at the fact that like, you know, there's so much pressure, I think, especially when you're when you're in high school and about to graduate on like, you need to pick the one thing that you're going to do for the rest of your life. I like, know. It's there, there's a lot of pressure to to have like that forward thinking in mind. 
I a hundred percent get what you're saying. When I graduated, I um I wanted to do something with web design actually. Okay. But at the time, it wasn't like in the curriculum. Like I graduated in in 1999, and so the web was still kind of becoming a thing. The internet was still becoming a thing, mm-hmm. and like when you went to school, like the the closest thing that there was was like computer science or computer engineering. There wasn't any sort of like UX or anything. I don't think those mm-hmm. terms, at least not in the general knowledge of design really existed back then. And like, I took my first semester, it was all this programming stuff. Didn't like it at all. I mm-hmm. was like, I, I don't like this. Went to my advisor, told him I wanted to do websites and, and like build stuff for the internet. And he was like, you know, the internet's a fad. You're not gonna, you're not gonna stick around <laughs> if this is what you want to do. You should change your major. Mm-hmm. And so I changed my major to math. But, and I mean, this is partially true, but it's also what I tell people, like, I just changed my major to math because I like math. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any sort of idea of like, I'm going to be a mathematician or I'm going to be a math teacher. I had no clue what to do with a math degree. I just (laughs) liked math. But also when I did the math on like my credits that I had so far, like stuff I had transferred from high school, I was like, wait a minute, I could graduate a semester early if I switch over to math and I could still stay at my scholarship program. So that's, that's what I did. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's important. <laughs> because like later as a working designer, you know, I always get people that are just like baffled that I have a math degree. Like why math? I'm like, mm-hmm. I, I just, I like math. I didn't really have any <laughs> career plans also because the scholarship program that I was in was set up where you did two internships at NASA facilities. Oh, cool. And so The goal was like, you do those two internships. And then when you graduate, you have a job at NASA. And I was like, well, shit, I don't have to really think about what I have to do. All I have to do is just graduate college and I got a job waiting for me. But 9-11 happened when I was in my junior year and they changed like stuff with the program where the seniors that were graduating in 2002 would still get to go to their NASA assignment or whatever, but not the ones after that. And so I was working at the High Museum at the time, selling tickets at the High. (laughs) That was the job I had when I graduated because I had nothing lined up at all. I had no sort of career plans even coming out of college because I thought like, oh, I'm set, you know. Mm -hmm. So I get it. I completely understand like not having an idea of like what you really want to do. I sort of fell into design because I had it as a hobby. I was still doing it on the side. And then, you know, now it's what I do. But I had no plan at all. I yeah. was just like, but I mean, rolling I feel with the punches. Like it's absurd to ask somebody that's 18 years old, what is their plan? You know what I mean? Like, you're 18. <laughs> and yeah. if you think about it in high school, you're not exploring all these different career paths. Like, you know, mm-hmm. you're taking geometry and English. Like, I don't know. <laughs> you, I just feel like to have your whole career planned out as a freshman in college is wild. Like that's bonkers to me. Yeah. (laughs) So yeah, like I think everybody should kind of start out undecided or I think maybe college your first year, you, everybody takes classes and every, like in all kinds of different things. So that sophomore year, maybe you can have some inkling of what you want to do, but like freshman Mm -hmm. year, that's crazy. So like, I didn't know, basically I just chose it randomly. I was like, yeah, or, businesswoman. That you know, I can be a businesswoman, sure. <laughs> or do like a a gap year or something. Yeah. You know, just something to kind of give yourself at that time frame like more of, of an idea of what it is that you want to do. Because I mean, mm-hmm. also, I mean, look, as a freshman, I was out partying too. Yeah, the like, the, that's the all clubs you know, used to early. send buses. Yeah. <laughs> the clubs used to send buses to campus mm-hmm. to pick us up and take us to the club and yep. then bring us back to campus, mm-hmm. like. I almost, I mean, I told this story on the show before. I almost flunked out freshman year because I was, I was partying, almost lost my scholarship. I had to pull it together. Yeah. I really did. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but you're living life. That's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's what I picked just at random. Um, I mean, Howard was amazing, though. I wouldn't change that for the world. Mm-hmm. But yes, if I could go back now, I would do graphic design or, you know, be an art major or something, something that pertains to what I do now. But at the time, yeah, yeah it was random. Yeah. I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? Like right. You, you can always kind of look back and know, yeah, this is what I should do because it will make sense for what I'm doing now. So mm-hmm. I, I get that. Yeah. 
So when you graduated, like what kind of work were you doing right after you graduated? So right after I graduated, I had an internship because I knew that I hated marketing and I knew I didn't want to do anything in marketing. And at that time, I a friend of mine worked at a fashion PR place in L.A. And so she said, you know, I don't know what your plans are after graduation, but you can come intern with us if you want. And at mm-hmm. that point, I had no other plans. <laughs> that was the only <laughs> thing on the table. So I said, yes, I will do that. So I lived in L.A. for like nine months, I believe. And I interned there. And during that time, I was kind of like, OK, I don't I don't know what I'm working toward. Like, do I want to do fashion? Like, what am I doing? Basically, mm-hmm. <laughs> I started realizing that, you know, I really like graphic design. I really like art direction. You know, I want to see what this path has to offer. And I remember senior year before graduation, I remember I set up a meeting with my career advisor and I said, who are the people that make ads? And she said, that's called an art director. And I remember going home and Googling how to be an art director and Mm. came up with these schools where you could, you know, get a degree in art direction. And so while I was interning in LA, I just was applying to all of these art direction programs and ended up getting into SCAD. Or no, I ended up getting into Miami ad school and, you know, those ad school type places. But it's just like a certificate of completion. Like it's not a degree in any way. Right. And so I realized I wanted to go to SCAD because I could get a degree. And so I applied to SCAD for their grad program, and I ended up not getting in because I didn't have an advertising portfolio, which is Mm. needed for the grad program. I ended up moving back to Atlanta and taking classes at SCAD, not in the grad program, but just as a regular student. And I took like Photoshop, Illustrator, I learned all the programs and then got my professors to write me letters of recommendation for the grad program and then ended up reapplying and getting in the second time. Nice. I think that's really something that you still kind of had this vision, but you just sort of found different ways to kind of get to it. I mean, one, taking Mm -hmm. these these courses and getting these certificates, at least you got your feet wet with what it would entail Mm -hmm. without sort of fully getting in first. But also you use that to help build your portfolio. So then you can apply and get into SCAD. So yeah, I like that. I like that approach. Mm -hmm. And all of the people in my program, you know, they had had art direction as their majors as undergrads. Like they all had been working towards this grad program for like years. Whereas I, had just heard about it my senior year right before graduation on what an art director even was, you know? So Mm -hmm. I was very much behind everybody. Like I was just now learning Photoshop, whereas these people, you know, knew Photoshop all through college and were designers and things like that. So I definitely felt behind, I will say. But but yeah, Mm -hmm. I mean, my goal was to get into this program and kind of just bunker, you know, like hunger down and just learned what I needed to learn and reapplied. So, Yeah. I mean, aside from the curriculum focus, like how was SCAD different from Howard? Oh, it's different in every way possible, I think. (laughs) (laughs) I I remember my very first day at SCAD, I walked into the cafeteria and there was like a classic pianist playing classical music on the piano. And I was just like, oh my God. Where am I? Because at Howard, there's like, (laughs) (laughs) you're like twerking while you're eating the lunch to the DJ. You know what I mean? Like it's a party. (laughs) And I go to SCAD and it was like a person playing classical music on the piano and everybody kind of eating in silence. And I was just like, what did I do? (laughs) It's very different. Very, very, very different. And also, I think art school is just way more competitive Um, Mm -hmm. like art is so subjective and so it's just way more competitive environment, I think, than Howard was. Aside from, I guess, that competitiveness, like, did you find like community there? Did you sort of make friends there? Because one thing I've heard from folks that are on the show that will go to, you know, like a SCAD or a MICA or something like that is that it can be a bit difficult sometimes to kind of find community. Yeah, I, I can see that for sure, because 
it's so competitive. Like your classmates are not your friends. You know what I mean? Like you're going, (laughs) (laughs) you're going against them. You're a lot of times at SCAD, you do group projects because I don't know, you just do a lot of group projects. At least in my major, we did a lot of group projects. And it was so competitive because after graduation, you don't want the same portfolio as your classmates because you're all Mm. applying to the same jobs, right? So you want to stand out. So I think in that sense of it, you're not, I don't know, you're just not as friendly. You're not as like welcoming because you want to distance yourself from your classmates so that you stand out come graduation time. So I can understand how people say it's hard to make friends. I did make one of my best friends at SCAD. And, you know, I I think I had a a handful of friends that are still really close to me that Mm -hmm. I see all the time. So for me, that wasn't the case, but I definitely can see how people feel that way for sure. Yeah. Now, did you go to SCAD here in Atlanta or the one in Savannah? I went to the Atlanta campus. Okay. All right. Well, you're right there in in Midtown then, and Mm -hmm. you're from the city. So I think that probably was a a big advantage, at least socially, because you didn't have to stay in that bubble of SCAD. Like you could go see your parents or whatever. Like you you, You could break out of that and still be in a city that you're familiar with. Yeah. But if I was to do it again, I'd go to Savannah, though. Oh, really? Why's that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I would have loved to just live in a a new city, a different city than one Mm -hmm. that I was already so familiar with. Like when I go to visit Savannah, I I always think like, why didn't I come here? Like, it's such a cool city. If I could do it again, I definitely would go to Savannah rather than Atlanta. Okay. Now, with Neighborly that you mentioned earlier, Did you start Neighborly while you were at SCAD or was it before then? No, I started Neighborly in New York when I lived in New York. So right after SCAD's graduation, I got hired in New York. Oh, nice. Yeah, I know you, I, as I did my research, of course, I see that you've worked for quite a few agencies. You did four years at YNR, which is is now a VML YNR. Uh, You did a year at the Energy Group. You did a little over a year at Havas. You were at, when you were in New York, you were at Havas, right? When I was in New York, I was at VML YNR. Okay, VML mm-hmm. YNR. When you look back at those experiences collectively, how do you think they really help prepare you for the kind of work that you do now? I think starting out as a junior art director in New York probably was the most enlightening experience as far as like learnings. You know, New York has a different work ethic, in my opinion. <laughs> Like starting out my career in New York, I mean, I was working till 10 p.m. every night. And and this was pre-COVID. So there's no remote working. There's no, I'm going to take this call from home. There's no, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like you're in the office until 10, 11 o'clock at night. Like I remember there was one time, and this is with like hard drives and things like that. So I remember there was one time I had to physically go take a hard drive to one of my boss's apartment at like two in the morning. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Because they needed this hard drive for a client presentation the next day. Like it was grueling. Like you just learn so much. You learn how to talk to clients. It was my first time going on set. It was my first time traveling. Like I traveled to Uruguay for like shooting and things like that. It was like a crash course in advertising, pretty much. You mentioned the the hard drive at 2 a.m. That for some reason that reminded me of the Devil Wears Prada. Yeah. Where Andy has to take like the the magazine to Miranda's apartment. And Mm -hmm. she's like, put it on the desk. Yep. Don't talk to anyone. Just put it on the (laughs) desk. Yes. Yes. And as a junior art director, I mean, you're the one that's going to have to do it. (laughs) Yeah. Like, you know, who else is going to do it? Not a senior person. That was the life for four years in New York. It was grueling for sure. What brought you back down to Atlanta? Just wanted to break out of that? Yeah. I mean, I was kind of at the point where, you know, I love New York. Let me just say Mm. that. I love New York, but it's expensive. I was at the point where I was like, you know, I'm tired of being broke. I'm tired of not being able to save any money. I'm tired of working to death, basically, (laughs) like just working Mm -hmm. into the night and things like that. And so it was to the point where I was just like, you know, I want to come back to Atlanta. 
I put in my notice and I came back to Atlanta where I freelanced for about a year before moving to Chicago. That year was ended up being great. I got to be with my family, be with my friends. But, you know, freelance, you have your own struggles with freelance. But at the time, to me, it was better. It was what I needed to do. I needed yeah. to just, yeah. And I'd say, you know, good on you for recognizing that. Because I think sometimes, especially when you're really locked into a particular job or a particular pattern, you know, mm-hmm. A lot of the popular advice, I don't I guess you could say it's popular advice, but a lot of the stuff you'll hear is that you have to sort of stick with it. You got to pay your dues, et cetera. But like if it's really weighing on you and like it's really affecting your day to day, like, you know, it takes a lot to break out of that. Yeah. I also think now is just a totally different climate than back then. Like now, Mm. I think just a lot of things have slowed down since covid And now it's like, you know, hybrid work models or people working from home. And I just think it's a lot more laid back than back then. Do you think it's starting to ramp up again? I think it's starting to ramp up again, but hopefully not to the point where it was then. Like that was (laughs) that was just I was working around the clock. Yeah, it sort of feels like now with companies we're at. What's a good analogy for this? It's almost like when you're trying to learn how to drive a stick shift and you can't sort of get the rhythm between like the brake and the clutch and the, and the, you Mm -hmm. know, trying to get all that together. And it's kind of jerky back and forth. I feel that sort of like feeling is happening right now with companies that are still trying to decide how they're going to operate with employees, Mm -hmm. quote unquote, post pandemic. Yeah. I mean, you know, the country said the pandemic is over. The government's like, we're not funding, you know, whatever, whatever. But COVID is still out there. Some places that have went remote are either continuing to go remote or they're deciding on remote or hybrid. They're still trying to sort of figure out what the rhythm is. Because before the pandemic, Mm -hmm. the rhythm kind of was, as you said, kind of just go, go, go. This is how it is. Mm -hmm. Now that people see that there's another way to work and another way to live and still be able to get work done, companies are like, we still have all this office space. Like, what are we going to do with that? We want people to come in the office two days a week, three days mm-hmm. a week. They're still trying to figure it out, I think. Yeah, it's definitely silent battle right now between the employers and the employees as far as like hybrid versus remote versus two days, three days a week. It's definitely a back and forth going on right now. Some agencies are like, we're fully remote, so or work from anywhere you know, and then some people are like, no, we're in the office, come in the office every day. <laughs> mm-hmm. The last place where I worked was fully remote. And I think one of the people who worked there really took advantage of that a lot mm. by just traveling to different countries. I mean, like we would meet with her and she's like, well, this week I'm in London and this other mm. week I'm in Paraguay or whatever. And the company eventually had to say, OK, you need to stay in one place. Oh, really? Because yeah, was well, she the getting reason her work done though, she was getting her work done. But the problem is, or I guess the problem that arose, at least as how I heard it, was that because she was jumping from country to country with different time zones and stuff, there's just certain countries that the business can't do business from. Mm. So, and I mean, not like political dissident companies, like she wasn't in North Korea or anything like that. But <laughs> like, there were just certain places she was at where they were like, okay. We're not sure that you can work from there. Uh, We need you to kind of stay in one place for a while because it's making paying you difficult. Because she would be in one, yeah, because she'd be in like one place one month, one place somewhere else, just kind of jet setting around. Because in my mind, I was like, she can't be getting paid that much, like (laughs) to be doing all this jet (laughs) setting between countries. Maybe she was, I don't know. (laughs) But yeah, eventually they told her, okay, you need to like stay somewhere for a while, and then. I think once she did that, she was somewhere maybe for about a month or so. They laid her off. Oh, no. Well, they laid all of us off. So we all were kind of in the same boat. But like, (laughs) it was so weird because I know that that's something that people have done during the pandemic is just take advantage of the fact that you could work remotely. Why not work from anywhere? But the company was like, nope, you need to stay somewhere for a while because Mm -hmm. we can't keep track of where you're at. And it's messing up, I guess, business operations with how we pay you or something like that. Oh, interesting. I wonder if it's because of like taxes or something. I also think they just didn't like her. (laughs) I think that could have been part of it, too. 
you know, we're all working. Don't get me wrong. But yeah. like if you're working hard and then someone else is working hard, but this person is like mm. jet setting between all these places, I think I, I think it might have been a little bit of jealousy. Like they were like, OK, you need to <laughs> stay your ass in one place and stop doing all this traveling around because I can't travel. So why do you get to travel? That's what I right. think it was. But yeah, they had a, you know, like a more if, friendly, corporate friendly excuse. Yeah, because if she's getting her work done and she you know what I mean? That should be what counts. You know, and if she's working the hours of the everybody else, I don't know. I don't yeah, see I don't know. But again, it's sort of like what I talked about before. Companies are just trying to figure out yeah. how to sort of work now in this new environment because this is such a, a new thing. Like mm-hmm. before you went to the office, you worked your eight hours or whatever, and you went home. Like right. work was that sort of other place. And now that your work can also be where you live. And if you mm-hmm. can do that from anywhere, why stay at the place that you're at. So I don't know. Yeah. Now with the work that you do with neighborly, you got a full-time gig and the book, like how do you, how do you balance all of that? Yeah. I, I don't think I'm good at it to be honest. (laughs) (laughs) The book was a labor of love. There were nights that I stayed up to like two, three in the morning, finishing those drawings because you're on a timeline, you know, and that timeline generally isn't going to move because of you. You know what I mean? Especially if the book comes out on a certain day, that's it. You can't just say, oh, I need another month. You have to be on somebody else's timeline. So there were nights that I stayed up to like two, three in the morning and then literally woke up at like seven to start my normal work day. So yeah, not not fun, but I knew that doing the book was a long-term goal of mine and not every day you have this opportunity for something that you basically been dreaming about and it the opportunity presents itself, you kind of have to just buckle down and do it. So yeah, not fun, but <laughs> but I did it. Neighborly right now we're at the point where we fulfill orders obviously from the orders that come in on our website, but it's a lot of just negotiating with buyers right now for Mm -hmm. like those larger wholesale orders. So we had Valentine's cards and Urban Outfitters this past Valentine's Day. So those orders are the gigantic orders. Um, Mm. And if that's the case, if we have a big order, like for TJ Maxx or Marshalls or whatever, that's when we hire people to help us out because those orders could be like 20,000 cards. Um, Wow. And if that's the case, we hire packagers, we hire people to help us fulfill the order, like put them in boxes and things like that, ship them out. Mm -hmm. So those come, obviously those aren't like every day that we're fulfilling those large orders. So it's it's more manageable. You know, it's Mm -hmm. every once in a while we get these big orders and then we hire helpers. So it makes it way more easier for us. Wow. I mean, I was I mean, I was saying freelance and not in a in a pejorative way, but like it's a business. Oh, yeah. Since the Today Show, we have gotten these huge wholesale orders. We've been in paper stores. We've been in Urban Outfitters. We've been in Marshalls, TJ Maxx, Home Goods. So yeah, with with those big orders, you definitely need help. It's way more than just me and my business partner can fulfill because they're mm-hmm. just so large. So yeah, we have a, a list of packagers that we hit up that just kind of help out when needed. So it sounds like the Today Show was like a really big boost for you. Oh, 100,000% for sure. <laughs> for sure. Like, I don't remember if, if you're saying that we we're in 20 stores, which could be, could be right. I just don't remember. Before the Today Show, I mean, now, I mean, we're in thousands because of these these large wholesale orders. Like with Home Goods, that was like 800 stores right there with the Home Goods order. So, yeah, we've gotten into a lot of stores for sure. (laughs) (laughs) It's so interesting how creatives that I've had on the show, and it's usually ones that do like some kind of digital creative work, like full time in some capacity. They always have like a side project or a side business or something Mm -hmm. that is tactile. Like it's cards, it's home goods, it's ceramics. Like Mm -hmm. it's always something tactile. I wonder, like, is that on purpose? I wonder, I don't know. I find that to be interesting. Yeah. I mean, you don't have clients. (laughs) No, that's true. When it's tactile, nobody telling me 
what I need to do with the design or the artwork. <laughs> like, it's no client. <laughs> You're doing it for yourself. Yeah. At least that's what I would think it would be. But that's what it is for me. I knew that, you know, if I'm going to do something on the side, I don't want any clients. I want to do what I want to do, do what I like, do what my business partner likes. And that's it. We're just, we're doing what we want to do. And that's it. I mm-hmm. mean, we do do custom cards, which in that case, we'll have a client. But for the most part, it's, you know, what we want for the line, what we envision for the line, what we want to put out, whether it be notepads or journals or calendars or whatever. Like it's, we're doing what we want to do pretty much. Mm-hmm. I mean, we take into account what our audience likes and what our audience wants to see, but there's nobody saying, no, make that blue purple. Like, no, that, yeah. that's all me and my business partner. I got you. That makes a lot of sense. And when you put it that way, I like that. Yeah. For the retailers, are you normally just shooting for these like larger big box stores or like our smaller boutiques also a, a target? Oh, yeah. We're in boutique stores all across the world. Actually, now we have some international ones, oh. too. But you know, with the smaller boutique stores, they're smaller orders just because they're, you know, mom and pop shops. Um, Mm -hmm. So we definitely do reach out to the big box stores as well, because that's the huge orders that span for 800 stores, like in the TJX case or, you know, Urban Outfitters and things like that. That's where the huge orders come from. Gotcha. That makes sense. So with everything that you're working on, like, what do you want to try to accomplish for the rest of the year? So at the beginning of this year, I I had some goals and I can't believe it's already summer. And I feel like I haven't done many of my goals that I set out to do. One of the goals was to learn 3D software. So I actually start my 3D class tomorrow. So I'm really excited about that. I'm going to be learning Cinema 4D, which I have been wanting to learn for a while. And then other than that, I want to start working on these other children's books ideas that I have. I have so many ideas, so I want to start putting those to p- pen to paper. And then with Neighborly, we have a lot of ideas for products, new products that we want to roll out. So want to start getting those into stores and on the website so that people can start purchasing those. And then just doing more, you know, with advertising. I want to build up my portfolio more and go on some more shoots and productions. Looking forward to that too. Now for someone that is, is listening to what you've accomplished, they're hearing about all your success and they want to kind of follow in that same vein. Like what kind of advice would you give them? I would say, to start freelancing, start doing things on the side. A lot of times, if you do what you want to do on the side, a lot of times it can become your full time. So, you know, if you're not getting the work that you want to do in your full time job, just start creating it on the side. I've had side hustles and side projects pretty much since I started in advertising, um, I realized that, you know, I just wanted to spread my wings and not have to do everything for a client. You know, I want to sometimes just create for myself. And so I've always just had things going on on the side, whether it be for freelance or just because I wanted to do it. And that has helped me so much in just growing my portfolio and getting other business So I would say always, always just like do things on the side, just do things for yourself, do things just to stay creative because you want to, and it always lead to something. It it always will lead to bigger things. If you could go back and give teenage Carmel that wanted to be in the video, (laughs) if you could give her some advice, (laughs) knowing what you know now, what would you tell her? I will probably say... Don't be afraid to explore just art, the art world and things that you think are unattainable. Because when I was growing up, I didn't have like artists around me. You know, my mom is a doctor and my dad is a lawyer. And so I wasn't in the art space. I didn't know an artist. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anybody in advertising. This is all something I found out late in life. 
I always drew and painted and things like that, but I didn't think it was attainable. I didn't think being an artist was, you can make a living off of it. So I would tell myself, just explore those things, like explore what makes me happy without having that fear of, am I going to make it, you know, in the art world? Like just be fearless and explore what makes me happy, basically. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Like, what's the next chapter for Carmel Kendall? I see myself doing more books, having books on the shelves in stores everywhere, having neighborly and on the shelves in stores everywhere. I see myself just learning new things. I believe that I'm a student for life. So learning new programs, learning new software, Um, I always just want to stay experimenting with my craft. Hopefully my artwork has evolved in five years. Hopefully it doesn't look like it does now. I want to, you know, always be continuing to evolve and just being a better artist and designer is what I see for myself. Well, just to wrap things up here, where can our audience find out more information about you, about your work, about Neighborly? Where can they find that information online? Yeah, well, they can always go to my website, which is carmelkindle.com. The book is called Your Freedom, Your Power, which is available everywhere books are sold. And then for Neighborly, they can go to neighborlypaper.com and find a list of all the stores that we are in, or they can just purchase directly from neighborlypaper.com. All right. Sounds good. Carmel Kendall, I want to thank you so, so much for coming on the show. You know, as I was kind of pulling my research together for this, I kind of always have like a thought in my mind about like who the person is before I talk to them and like what the interview might come to be like. And the main thing I'm getting from this is like hometown hero, like (laughs) from the A left, did your own thing, came back. You've got this great business. It's, it's a fun business, but you're also still kind of working in the advertising world as well. And like, from what I can tell, just from talking with you, like you're keeping it humble. Like you're certainly super proud of the work that you've done and the success that you've accomplished, but like, you're also super humble about it. That's a really good quality to have, especially, you know, in this world where there's just so much like posturing and clout chasing and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, I get from you that you are like the genuine real deal. And I'm excited, really excited to see where your work goes in the future. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate Aww, it. Thank you so much for having me. Like I said, I, I've been following you since 2020 when I listened to you on a podcast. So I was very ah. honest. <laughs> big, big thanks to Carmel Kendall. And of course, thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Carmel and her work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. Revision Path is supported by Brevity & Wit. Brevity & Wit is a strategy and design firm committed to designing a more inclusive and equitable world. They are always looking to expand their roster of freelance design consultants in the U.S., particularly brand strategists, copywriters, graphic designers, and web developers. If you know how to deliver excellent creative work reliably and enjoy the autonomy of a virtual-based freelance life with no non-competes, check them out at brevityandwit.com. Brevity and Wit, creative excellence without the grind. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch, a multidisciplinary creative studio located in Atlanta, Georgia. Our executive producer is Maurice Cherry, and our editor and audio engineer is RJ Basilio. Intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre, with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. Transcripts are courtesy of Brevity and Wit. If you like this episode, please let us know. We're on Instagram. We're also on Twitter slash X or whatever at Revision Paths. You can find us in both of those places at Revision Paths, just all one word. Or you could follow us on Spotify. Uh, You could follow us on Amazon Music. You could be like Art Girl One and leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. Or you could leave us a voicemail message on our hotline at 626 Six zero three zero three one zero. As always, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>